Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone happily tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that the Lord will reward your faithfulness being there every time. Are you here? Good amen. I know our leaders, all our workers in every location, every region and state, in every nation as well, as we team together, hear the word of God and go to deliver to God's people, blessings will follow our ministries in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you tonight and bless your name for your word. Your word ever new and ever fresh and penetrating every heart. We pray, Lord, that your blessings will accompany your word tonight in every heart, in every life. In Jesus' name, as you are training us, you transform us and you transport your very mind, your word, your desires unto the people we are ministering to. I pray that the word will benefit us and profit the people we are preaching and ministering to in Jesus' name. In every house fellowship, in every little group, in every church, in every congregation and assembly, that your name will be lifted up and that your power will get to the hearts of the people. And we pray, Lord, that our ministry of preaching will not be in vain. It will bear fruit, fruit in our hearts and fruit in our lives and fruit. In every place we preach and declare your word in Jesus' name. We pray that your spirit will go with the word and make use of the word we're hearing to make the people stand and stay stable and solid in the place where you have planted every one of us. And Lord, will bless the people and will profit the people we're ministering to in Jesus' name. Keep us awake at a large as we hear your word today that will not sleep on you while you are speaking and that the word will bring revival fire in every heart in Jesus' name. Be glorified in every life. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. God bless you. You can see them. We're coming to Psalm 24. And we're reading from verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24, reading from verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? And then in verse 4, the answer comes. And it says, he that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Here David, the psalmist, a king, the king of Israel, he was asking, he wanted to know, after this world is over, after all the service of man on earth is over, after we come face to face with God, after death or after the rapture, who shall stand in the heel of the Lord and who shall abide in his place forever? Isn't that what we should be thinking about? Because there's no man, there's no woman, there's no believer, there's no saint that comes to this world and remains in the world forever. We don't even want to remain in the world forever. The world, like the wilderness, is so dangerous and so terrible. Nobody wants to live in the wilderness of the world forever. We want to go to the great beyond. Even if we did not want to go, one day we will leave this world. And when we leave this world, it should be our concern where will I spend eternity? And where will you spend eternity? That's why the question is very important. Who shall abide in the heel of the Lord? Who shall stay? Who shall dwell? Who shall remain permanent forever, eternally in the holy heel of the Lord? It's asking for who will get to heaven? What are the qualifications? What are the things God will look at so that we can get to heaven? And then the answer comes from the Lord himself. He that has clean hands. The opposite of clean is unclean. Those who have unclean hands 
unclean lips, like Cassia said, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Those who have unclean lips, unclean language, unclean character, unclean behavior, unclean secrets. They will not get there. But the people that come through, they come through Christ, our Savior, the one who purges us and the one who purifies us and the one that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He then, having gone through the provision of Calvary, he then, having gone through the cleansing in the blood of the Lamb, he has clean hands, clean character, clean behavior and clean manners he that has clean hands and a pure heart it's not one or the other it's one and the other the outward expression of our salvation we have clean hands the outward expression which we see in a behavior we have clean character the outward expression which we see from day to day the things we do that others can see the things we do during the day the behavior the character the lifestyle he that has clean hands and a pure heart the opposite of pure is impure impure if the heart is impure remember the body will be buried after death and the soul the spirit the heart that will go to god to uh, to account for everything that we have done and actually is the heart that is the issue of our life it is what comes to the heart what we meditate on in the heart what we produce from the heart that is what actually determines everything we do the heart is the source of every action and the source of every language and the source of all the behavior that will manifest and so must have pure heart if the heart is still like in the original stage it's inbred the inbred scene will be there if the heart is in the original stage it will be depraved it will be impure it will be unholy it will be unacceptable in the sight of the lord he that has clean hands and a pure heart and then there's something that you know a person having clean hands and a pure heart there is something he will not do who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity no swan deceitfully who are the people that said swear deceitfully they do something that they know is wrong and they say i swear to god they say i can i swear that they say so and they always you don't have to swear if you're really doing the truth the truth will speak for itself but the people that swear deceitfully they swear wrongly they swear to something for God to testify to something that is not true. Those people are not really well connected with the Lord. Who are the people that will dwell in the hill of the Lord and abide in his holy place? They are the people that have clean hands. They are the people that have a pure heart. They are the people that do not swear deceitfully and they do not lift up their soul unto vanity. We're looking at three points here as we're concerned the message tonight on the hands and the heart of heaven bound saints we are heaven bound we want to get to heaven and we want to know we're not going to be offended if anybody tells us how to get rich how to get wealthy if anybody tells us how to have good hell how are we going to get angry or get offended if somebody tells us the way to heaven the qualification to be in the sight of the lord in the presence of the lord forever and ever if there is any joy we have is that somebody is uh, interested in, in us enough to say 
this is the way to heaven. If there is any interest we have, it should be in the person that says, look, look at the provision God has made and look at the provision Christ has made. Look at the sacrifice of Christ that we benefit from that gets us to heaven. How happy are we? We belong to a church that can tell us this is the way. How fortunate we are that we have a leader, a teacher, a pastor, a shepherd, a guide that can say, look at the word of God. Let's read it together. Let's search it together and let's let us benefit together. This is the way to heaven. That's why we're talking about this important subject, the hands and the heart of heaven bound says three things we're looking at number one number one the corrupt hands and perverse hearts of hell bench sinners there are sinners that are on their way to hell and they are hell bent and they want to do everything that they even go there sooner than they should get their hell bent determined that that place they say there's a hell then they hurry to get there now what do they do how do they live how do they comport themselves the corrupt hands and perverse hearts of hell bent sinners number two the clean hands and pure hearts of heaven bound saints there are people from our youth from our young age who have heard about heaven and the preachers whether they were born again or not i can't tell now but they so spoke about heaven and we sang about heaven and they told us about the angels there and they told us about the beauty of heaven and the glory of heaven and we said that's where i want to go that's where I want to spend eternity. But he didn't tell us what do we do? How do we behave? How do we live? So that we can get to that place number two. The clean hands and pure hearts of heaven bound saints. Number three, the consecrated hands. We don't want to get there alone. We want to get there with other people. And so our hands, our skill our energy everything we have we consecrate to the lord so we can touch that life transform that life bring that other one and we can say let's go along we consecrate everything we have so we can take other people to heaven with us we're looking at number three the consecrated hands number three the consecrated hands and persevering hearts of heralding servants those who come to herald those who come to announce the coming of the Lord consecrated hands and persevering hearts of heralding servants number one now number one we're looking at the corrupted hands and perverse hearts of hell bench sinners we're looking at psalm 26 reading from verse 9 psalm 26 verse 9 gather not my soul with sinners nor my life with bloody men verse 10 verse 10 says whose hands is innocent is mischief and their right hand is full of Bribes. Those ones, uh, you know, they are hell bent. They have heard this is the way to perdition, but they do it anyhow. This is the way to hell, but they go through that way all the same. In Isaiah chapter 33, reading there from verse 14, Isaiah 33, verse 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. You wouldn't think of sinners being in Zion, but the Bible says Zion, a beautiful city, the great city, the perfect city of a living God, yet there are sinners there. It says the sinners in Zion are afraid. It says fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites who among us shall dwell with devouring fire who among us shall dwell with everlasting bunnies we're looking at three subtitles here number one number one we're looking at the description of hideous corrupted hands number two the discernment of hidden 
controlling hands. Number three, the damnation of hellish condemned hearts. Look at number one there. Number one is the description of hideous corrupted hands. Hideous corrupted hands. It says in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15, Isaiah 1 15, and when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear why your hands are full of blood. These are religious people. They spread their hands in prayer before God, in worship before God. They make many prayers, many kinds of prayers. And yet God says, I will not hear because their hands are full of blood. Their hands are full of blood. Murder, killing other people. Whether they count those people as their enemies, as their competitors, whatever. If you kill another person made by God, your hands are full of blood. There are people that say, I wasn't expecting this baby. What am I going to do? And they decide they're going to abort that baby. They're going to shed the blood of that innocent baby. The Lord says their hands are full of blood. Their hands are evil. It says in verse 16, in verse 16, it says, wash you, make you clean. Because because God requires that your hands should be clean. What have your hands been doing? What have your hands been practicing? What do you touch? What do you push? What do you attract? What do you bring? That God looks at you and he says, your hands are unclean. It says, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes cease to do do evil. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 59, we're reading from verse 2. Isaiah 59 verse 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid this face from you, that he will not hear. In verse 3, it says, in verse 3, it says, for your hands are defiled with blood. The, the defilement makes our hands unclean. Anything you do that defiles your hand, defiles your life, make your life filthy and dirty and makes your language and makes your person uh, when you are coming, you know the people, they may not be bold enough to tell you what to say. Is coming, she's coming. She's likely to tell a bad, dirty, filthy joke She's coming, he's coming, is likely to propound again something dirty. Anytime she comes, anytime he comes, what he tells us and what she tells us makes us feel like going for a wash because unclean. And to get those words again away from our hearts, it takes us a long time. The behavior, the action, the body language, the dressing brings filthiness into the minds, into the hearts of people. Your hands are defiled with blood. Your fingers waste iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perverseness. Those are the people and when people are like that, they must get to Calvary before they can get to heaven. They must go through the way of the cross so that they confess all those sins and they bring everything to the foot of Christ and they are washed and they are cleansed and now they have clean hands before they can Go on. In Micah chapter 7, I'm looking at verse 3. Micah chapter 7, we're looking at verse 3. That they may do evil with both hands earnestly. Those are the hell bench people. They do evil. You know, some people can do whatever they're doing with one hand. But then they say this must be done. Days of cleanness, they must say, you know, hold with both hands and then shovel it to other people. Though this uncleanness, they must use both hands honestly. 
with determination and with real consecration, they put all their mind, all their brain, and everything they've got into it so that they can spread the evil. It says they do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asketh, and the judge asketh for a reward, and the great man he uttereth his mischievous desire. So they wrap it up. Look at verse 4 there. In verse 4 it says, The best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn edge. And the day of thy watchmen and thy, and thy visitation cometh, now shall be their perplexity. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. The Gentiles, they have unclean hands. Either they set somebody's house on fire, or they destroy somebody's property hand, or they defile somebody's daughter hands, or they defile somebody's wife their hands, or they take bribes their hands, or they have unlawful gain, or they use their education and their training and their skill and their power to make somebody do evil. They have unclean hands and they do corrupt evil licentious things. We're looking at number two. Number two here, we're looking at the discernment of hidden controlling hands the discernment of hidden controlling hands you understand hidden uh, when somebody hides the hand and yet with that hand he has hidden he's doing evil and god still understands you hide your hand but you're doing evil you hide your face yet what your hand or you borrow somebody's hand and you do evil. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 14. In 2 Samuel chapter 14, I'm reading here from verse 19. It says, And the king said, Is not the hand of Joab with thee in all this? Joab was not there. Joab was not physically present. He was an evil strategist. He wanted somebody to go to the king and tell the king something as if what the woman was saying was totally from her. The hand of Joab was not seen. It was hidden. But when the woman came and told a deceptive story, to control the decision of the king. The king saw that. He said, it's not the hand of Joab with thee in all this. And the woman answered and said, as my, as said, thy soul liveth, my, my lord the king, none can turn to the right hand or to the left from from or to the left from us that my lord the king has spoken for thy servant Joab he bade me and he put all these words in the mouth of thine handmaid you see when you put you can't you don't want to do something directly you cannot do that thing directly. The circumstances will not allow you to do that thing directly. And you say, ah, you of all people, how can you say that? How can you do that? How can you go that direction? And then, but you want that evil thing to be done. Don't quote me. Don't mention my name. Don't tell them I sent you. But you know, 
go to him, go to her, and put it this way, construct the story this way, it will deceive him, it will jolt him, it will get him by surprise, and then the fellow comes and brings the word of deception. And the world that turns our world upside down Or the thing that brings evil Or the thing that controls us and sends us On a fool's errand To go and do And to go and say something wrong And yet you are standing behind And you are the one engineering that thing Your hands are not clean The person becomes the errand the errand boy, errand girl, errand man, errand woman of the sinful project. He too will be condemned by the Lord, but the Lord will know you are the hidden hand controlling the action that leads to evil. Uh, look at uh, chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 14. Chapter 11, we're looking at verse 14. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. You know the story. Uh, this uh, David, he had um, an illicit unlawful, unacceptable affair with the wife of Uriah. Uriah's wife is now pregnant. She was still at the stage of being able to get pregnant. There are people who are, who are past the age of getting pregnant, but they do evil too. But in the case of David, Bathsheba was pregnant. And now the thing will come out. And so we're told about what, what David did. He wrote a letter. And he wrote it by the hand of Uriah himself. The husband of that woman. Look at verse 15. In verse 15 it says, And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die now the physical hand of david did not kill uriah but he sent a letter that he wrote and uriah looking at david appeared innocent a leader in control of the battle and of the war. And Uriah got the letter. You know the story, but look at chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 9. In chapter 12, reading from verse 9, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him of the sword of the children of Ammon. Uh, look, at, uh, look at that in verse 10 now. In verse 10 it tells us, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from the house from thy house and because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife it was you know eventually it's traced to the hand of David you see God knows everything he knows what you engineer he knows what you strategize He knows what you do The evil you do You might do it through proxy By proxy You might do it through the hand of another person But God says I see you I see it You cannot hide that You don't have a clean hand You are not ready for heaven And if you are You know you have been doing something like that To use other people to do evil You use other people to tell lies You use other people to manufacture stories That will scatter The temple, the house, the assembly The congregation Of the people of God Your hands are not clean He wants us to live such lives 
die. If that, well, well, no, that our hands are clean. One, we don't do anything evil directly by our hands, and we don't hide our hands. Use other people and send them on the sinner's errand to go and do, to go and say something evil. We're looking at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're reading from verse 23. In Acts of the Apostle chapter 2, reading here from verse 23, him being delivered by the terminal counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Here Peter was preaching to the people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and he said, by wicked hands you found those wicked hands. The people that will do the crucifixion but you are responsible for the crucifixion. You are responsible for the, uh, for the slain of Christ that died. And then they said in verse 36, in verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom ye crucified whom ye crucified. Now, they didn't go there personally and take the nail and raise the hammer and then crucify Christ. They did it by proxy. They did it by other people's hands. But he said, you have done it. And they understood and they accepted that they used other people's hands but were responsible for the crucifixion. Verse 37, verse 37 says, Now when they had this, they were preach in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, we feel guilty. We're convicted. What shall we do? They were told to repent. Look at number three here. Number three, we're looking at the damnation of hellish condemned hearts. The damnation of hellish condemned hearts. We're told in Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, reading from verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things i'll do it and not be found out your heart is deceiving you and that's a bad heart that's an impure heart i'm going if i'm not going to be caught if i will not be found out if i will not be discovered then i can do it you don't really have a converted soul you don't have real salvation if all you care about is they will not know it's me i'll be hidden somewhere and i will be controlling all the bad evil things that happen and once they don't discover it's me and i escape the judgment of men you don't believe in god god is not in your thoughts you are not thinking God sees every action. God sees the man, the woman behind the curtain. No, you are not thinking of that. You don't really believe in God. You believe in God like the Pharisees. You believe in God like the Sadducees. You believe in God like the unconverted sinners in society. But in the real sense, to believe that God is everywhere. God sees everything. God knows everything. God will judge every evil thing that one. You do not believe. The heart is deceitful. And it says above all, all things and desperately wicked who oh, can know it look at verse 10 in verse 10 it says the I the Lord search the heart I try the race even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deed. That's why in Isaiah chapter 5, reading from verse 4, it says in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 4, 
uh, it says, I say, chapter 5, uh, looking at uh, verse 4, it says, What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I look that it shall bring forth, graves brought it forth wild graves it says everything i should have done i have done for us for the world yes saint jesus christ he lived a perfect exemplary life and then he went to the cross and he died for us and then it says whosoever will let him come and he says whosoever comes i really know why he's reject we have the opportunity we have the privilege to have clean hands at calvary from Christ that he can purge, he can forgive, he can cleanse, he can transform and change our lives. What, what can God do that he has not done for our salvation? And then he can purify our hearts, he can purge our hearts, he can sanctify us and make us to live a life that's acceptable in his sight. Are we willing to live that life? Or are we so interested in doing our evil? Are we so committed to doing evil that we don't even want to countenance Calvary? God says, what should I have done that I have not done for my people? Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitudes dried up with thirst and then in verse 18 in verse 18 water them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity it is picturing them as if they stand here or sit here and they position themselves there and if they don't have a chance to go out and do the iniquity they stay there and strategize and they draw iniquity to themselves it says one to them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were with a catch robe. It tells us in Hosea chapter 7, reading from verse 2. Hosea chapter 7, verse 2. And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. They don't think about God. There are people that they read the word, they, they study the word, they hear the word, but when it comes to practical action, they do not think about God. They just live like they used to live. They just they soil their hands like they used to soil their hands and they defile their minds and their hearts like they have always done. They do not think about God and they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness now their own doings have beset them about they are before my face it tells us in Matthew chapter 23 we're looking at verse 25 Matthew chapter 23 reading from verse 25 warn to you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites uh, have you do you love the way jesus christ will not deceive anybody in his preaching do you do you enjoy do you appreciate jesus christ the personification of the truth that he will not miss words he will not speak indirectly he will not speak with coded words he will not speak which you know something you will not understand he wanted them to get to heaven he wanted them to have clean hands and a pure heart he wanted them to realize that they were wrong so he spoke directly he said warn to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter but within 
they are full of extortion and excess. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, it tells us, Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. Righteous unto men. Uh, do you remember Judas Iscariot? Only Christ knew that he didn't have clean hands and a pure heart. All the other disciples, they thought they're the same. I'm saved, he's saved. We're sanctified, and he is sanctified. And they had like the same responsibility. And they were sent out, and I say, you know, Peter, John, and James, and Matthew, as they healed the sick. Look at Judas, he's also using the name of Jesus and healing the sick. And they all came back, and they didn't say all the other people successfully did the work, only Judas is killed. No. Nobody detected him, but Jesus said, Judas, that thing that doest, do quickly. But remember, it were better. The man of God, the son of man goes with is going. He's been ordained by the Father. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed and all the other people there could never guess that that was Judas Iscariot you know why he knew he perfected the trade he perfected the maneuvering he perfected using his hand and going to the Pharisees and saying what are you going to give me? I'll betray him unto you. And none of the other disciples knew that he was planning anything. But what shall it profit a Judas, a hypocrite, a backslider, if he gained the whole world and he loses his own soul? And he says, even so, ye also outwardly are righteous unto men but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity then it says in verse 33 in verse 33 ye serpents and ye generation of vipers how can ye escape the damnation of hell the damnation of hellish condemned has. We're coming to point number two. In point number two, we're looking at clean hands. We we'll visit Calvary and we we'll stay by faith after confession and repentance under the blood of the Lamb. And He washes us and He cleanses us and He turns our lives around and He purges and He purifies us. We we'll have clean hands and a pure heart. The clean hands and pure hearts of Heaven bound saints. You know, when you are really born again and you have heard of heaven, you're slow in doing whatever you're doing. You're not so quick. You remember what you were taught in school. You look before you leap. When you are born again, you ask yourself, don't be too much in a hurry. Your time is there and say, what's going to be the consequence of this if I do it? What's going to be the interpretation of this before the Lord if I do that? What's going to be the consequence of this if I touch it, if I drink it, if I put it in my mouth, if I cover it up? What's going to be the coming back of this to me on the final day if I do it now and it goes to record? I only think since they don't know and since they can't see, I can. No, you can't if you are thinking about heaven. You know, those of us who got converted, really converted, many, many years ago, before we did anything, we ask ourselves, do I want to face the possibility of making restitution on this? The gain and the pleasure I have from this, 
if I do it now, am I thinking of the necessary restitution I'll have to make later? Then we'll see the cost is too high. I, I won't like to make restitution on that, so I won't do it. I won't eat it. I won't smoke it. I won't imbibe that. I won't allow that to be part of my life. Would I, can I face God on the final day on this? Would I allow this to spoil my life and spoil my chance and debar me from getting to heaven? Or we ask ourselves questions before we did things. Those of us that were really born again many years ago, and because of that, we endeavored by His grace, by His enablement, by his discernment not to do anything that we will not be willing to correct and we have to correct that thing we have to correct that thing before we leave this world and cross over and get before the Lord we don't want to meet that thing at the white throne judgment we want to be able to say the grace of God kept me the blood of Jesus washed me and he kept me clean clean hands and pure hearts of heaven bound saints. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5 and we're looking at verse 8. In Matthew chapter 5 I say blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. We're looking at three things here. Number one number one we're looking at clean hands of heaven bound souls. Number two the pure heart of heavenly saints. Number three, truly confirmed holiness with heaven watch steadfastness. We're looking at number one. Number one, we're looking at the clean hands of heaven bound souls look at Job chapter 17 and we're reading from verse 9 in Job chapter 17 verse 9 the righteous also shall hold on his way and he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger as time goes on as time comes on, the challenges we face become greater. And the temptations we face, they become more terrible, traumatizing. And the threats we have, they become greater, life sapping. When we were younger, we had clean hands before the Lord. And then temptation came. There were those initial temptations. They were not, you know, very strong. And we could overcome them. And we catch the clean hands. But as time went on, the challenges became greater. The threats became greater. And the things that the people who wanted us to, that wanted, they became more inviting. And the personalities of the people that wanted to challenge us and say, do it. I told you, a man of authority, a woman in authority, do it. And then now, most people become weaker and weaker as they go on in life. And you face more terrible challenges. And uh, as you get older, uh, many people, they get more fearful and more timid. And the things they stood up to earlier in life, they cannot stand up to them anymore. They have been kind of threatened so many times. And they, feel, they have felt the pain of defying all those tempters so many times they, that they are now hands down but Job said it shouldn't be like that the God who helped us in the earlier years is still there and Christ who lives in us is greater than anything and anyone in the world and he says the righteous those who are righteous by faith and those who are righteous by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ they hold on on their ways and he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger amen
You'll be stronger in Jesus' name. Now, what we need to understand, you overcame with clean hands, courageous hearts, those earlier years, because in your salvation as a younger person, you were stronger than the tempter. You were stronger than the people that were inviting you to do something foolish and something filthy and something fleshly. But now, all those people that tempted you at that time and all the things that were drawing you at that time that you were stronger than the people who tempt you today and the people who tease you today and the people who draw you today they are stronger than those tempters, temptresses of the past and so if you remain at the same level of conviction at the same level of courage at the same level of strength they'll overcome you but if the enemies of today, if the tempters of today, if the temptresses of today, if the situation of today is higher and, and greater and stronger than the, the past, and then you also, you stay before the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, and you become stronger than you were many years ago, no matter how strong, stronger, strongest the enemies, the tempters are, you'll always be ahead of them. I will always be ahead of them. If they pull you down, you are not as strong as you ought to be. If they destabilize you, you are not as strong as you ought to be. If you say, okay, I'm still as strong as I was 20 years ago, that will not make it. That will not make it. You must be stronger than you were many years ago for you to have and to keep your victory. You will keep the victory. Uh, look at you know what is going on now and look at you know that selection another election is coming and you happen to be chosen to you know do this and do this by the by the by the nature of your work in society uh, the things the pressure that comes now is nothing to be compared with the pressures that came 10 years ago Things are more difficult now. And if you say at the same level that you were 10 years ago, they'll suck you up into the gutter. But because you're stronger and stronger, I am stronger and stronger. I will be stronger and stronger. The righteous shall hold on his way, and he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. Give me a good amen. amen. We're coming to number two here. Number two here, we're looking at the pure heart of heavenly saints. The pure heart of heavenly saints. We're looking at Acts of the Apostle chapter 15 and we're reading from verse 9. Acts of the Apostle chapter 15, reading verse 9, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their heart by faith. Put no difference between us and them on the side of God, he puts no difference between you and Enoch. The grace he provided for Enoch, he provides for you. Between with God, he puts no difference between you and Daniel. Between you and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the same grace he gave them, the same strength he gave them, the same fortitude he gave them, he is willing to give unto you. He put no difference between us and them. Look at Peter. He put no difference between Peter and Cornelius. He puts no difference between you and and Peter and Paul and Silas, the grace of God is still overflowing. The power of God is still available. They overcame in their own time and they maintained the purified heart and the pure heart. You will. You can. The Lord is not going to kind of cut down on his uh, grace, on his strength, on his promise because you are the one asking. There's no difference. He sanctifies them. He sanctifies us. 
He purged them. He purges us. He preserves them. And he preserves us as well in Jesus' name. He says, put you no know, difference between them and us, purifying their heart by faith. By faith. That's the only way he does it. Enoch, by faith. Abraham, by faith. Samuel, by faith. Daniel, by faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, by faith. And that faith is still what is required today. And God has not changed. They believe that God will preserve them from the pollutions of the land. And you believe that the Lord will preserve you from the pollutions, the farming filthiness of the land. And put no difference between them and us, purifying their hearts by faith. He'll do it for every one of us. And look at this. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these it shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified that's the word sanctified and made for the master's use and prepared unto every good work and then in verse 22 in verse 22 it says flee also youthful laws but follow righteousness Flee from the other and follow this one now. Follow righteousness and faith and charity and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. They call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The Lord had given them that purity of heart. It will give to every one of us. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 14. First Peter chapter 1, verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance. In verse 15, it says, But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. In all manner of conversation in all manner of conversation conversation in the day conversation in the night conversation in the family conversation outside the family conversation with believers conversation with non-believers that you make sure because God listens to every conversation and he watches every manner of life he watches what is done in the public and what is done in the private but as See which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Have you ever thought of that? Be ye holy because I'm in deeper life? No. Be ye holy because if my wife hears that. That I have that kind of, um, you know, suggestive relationship with that uh, woman, my wife will be offended. And my wife has hypertension and I don't want to increase her blood pressure. No, be ye holy for I am holy. From nation to nation. God is the same. I am holy. From denomination to denomination, God is the same. I am holy. In the private, in the public, God is the same for I am holy. The reason we uh, have the holiness experience actually will determine whether we will keep the holiness experience or not. I must be holy. Why? I want to walk in the church. What if there's no chance to walk in the church? I want to be holy because I want people to appreciate my lifestyle. What if after you become holy, they don't appreciate your lifestyle? What are you going to do? We must have the right reason. It says, be holy for I am holy. God is holy. And even if no man, no woman on earth sees what I do, I still must be holy because God 
is holy. And if we're going to God in heaven, if we're going to live with God in heaven, that's the reason to be holy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It says, be ye holy, for I am holy. Look at verse 22 there. In verse 22 there, it tells us, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren see that she love one another with a pure heart see that she love one another if you love somebody with an impure heart that's not love that's lost if you love somebody for an ulterior motive that's not love that's just hypocrisy if you love somebody and not from a pure heart a purified heart i'm not asking for anything here i'm not looking for anything i'm not looking for any gain here i'm not looking for you know they repaying me anything i just obey the lord and i love brethren the brethren i love the brothers i love the sisters with a pure heart if there is any hidden agenda if there is any impure motive if there is any unlawful gain we're looking for if there's any sinful pleasure we're looking for and so we're showing love we're manifesting love God understands the motive and that in the sight of God is not godly heavenly love it says see that she love one another with a pure heart fervently we're coming now to number three here number three here we're looking for truly confirmed holiness with heavenward steadfastness heavenward steadfastness in Ephesians chapter 4 we're reading from verse 23 and be renewed in the spirit of your mind be renewed in the spirit of your mind in verse 24 verse 24 says and that he put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true Holiness, you see it there, true holiness. There is false holiness. There is hypocritical holiness. There is make believe holiness. There is the superficial holiness we flaunt and you know we demonstrate before our neighbors so that they can say, you know, that person is holy. Now all that means nothing to you and means nothing to God but the true holiness that from your heart whether people see or not whether people praise you or not whether people appreciate you or not whether people honor you or not whether people persecute you or whatever they do you say this is unto God my heart, my life, everything I've got this is unto God and you have that recreation in righteousness and true holiness that is the heavenly virtue we ought to have and we need to be steadfast in that steadfast in that now there are people who are steadfast and they're you know just going around and around like the children of Israel all those 40 years they were always joining always joining they were steadfast but they were not progressing towards the promised land you don't want to be steadfast like that just steadfast steadfast doing the same thing going the same round and yet you are not making progress other people are steadfast but they are steadfast in marking time no progress and they are not moving forward they just steadfast 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 here but what we are talking about is being steadfast and taking steps that lead you towards heaven leading you towards heaven that what you want is that today must add to the progress towards heaven and this week must add to the progress towards heaven and this event and this activity and this thing that I do for the kingdom of God I'm steadfast in it I'm consistent in it I'm 
focused on it, but it's moving me forward and forward and forward. Can I ask myself a question? And then you ask yourself a question. Are there things I'm steadfast in, but doesn't give me progress? Are there things I'm skillful in and I'm persistent in? And it doesn't move me forward. Are there things I'm persistent in and, stead and steadfast in? And yet, I cannot say that today is better than 30 days ago. Let's re-examine what we do so that the progress we're making, the confirmed holiness we're having is heavenward, heavenward. And it's moving us nearer and nearer the glorious day. We're looking at um, First Thessalonians and I'm um, reading from chapter 3 and reading from verse 12. First Thessalonians chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 12 and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we you towards you in verse 13 verse 13 says to the end for the purpose for the result he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before god even our father at the coming of our lord jesus christ with all saints may he do that effect that in every life in jesus name we're coming into point number three. Point number three is consecrated hands and persevering hearts of heralding servants. Heralding servants. Who are the heralding servants? The people to announce to their world that Christ is coming and they herald that and they shout that out and they inform other people Christ is is coming and they get all the people prepared for the coming of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 40 I'm reading from verse 9 Isaiah chapter 40 verse 9 O Zion that bringeth good tidings get thee up into the high mountain O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings lift up thy voice with strength lift up lift it up be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. He comes, he comes. Behold your God. Say to the people of Judah, until they do not have any shadow of doubt, he is coming, he is coming soon. Is coming suddenly and he wants to come for his people. It tells us in Matthew chapter 25, reading from verse 6. It says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 6, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. He wants us to be the heralds like that. That we go to tell a community, we go to tell everyone that can listen to that will listen to us that the Lord is coming we have clean hands already we have pure heart already personally individually as children of God we are ready for his coming but we don't want to go we don't want to tell other people how we got clean hands how they can have clean hands we want to tell other people how we got a pure heart and they should have the pure heart too so that when we come like consecrated hands and persevering hearts heralding his coming as a servant three things we're looking at number one here we're looking at committed heralds proclaiming seriously of his is sure coming. Number two, consecrated hands, preparing subjects for a sudden return, a sudden coming. Number three, courageous hearts, perfecting saints for his soon coming. We're looking at number one. Number one, committed heralds, proclaiming seriously of his sure coming. It tells us in uh, Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. In Zechariah chapter 9 reading from verse 9, rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold thy king 
cometh unto thee. Thy king cometh unto thee. He is just having salvation and lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt the full of an ass. That's the prophecy that Christ was coming. And he was coming the first time for the salvation of the world, for the redemption of all humanity. And as uh, you know, the time was drawing near, um, Zechariah said, Tell them, tell them, behold, thy king cometh. And that's what they did in Matthew chapter 21, reading from verse 4. Matthew chapter 21, verse 4 all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the the prophet saying, saying in verse 5, verse 5, tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold thy king cometh unto thee. They announced his first coming and we are now to announce his second coming, meek and sitting upon an ass and if a coach of the fall of an ass. Look at number two. In number two, we're looking at consecrated hands preparing subjects for a sudden coming. It's going to come. It will come suddenly. Malachi chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 1. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. It has now fallen on us to announce and to proclaim the second coming of the Lord. And it will come suddenly. That's what it says there, that he comes suddenly. Look at First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. First Thessalonians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 5, talking about the coming of the Lord. And it says, but, uh, first, uh, first chapter 5, verse 1, it says, but the time for the of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. He'll come suddenly, suddenly, but he'll come surely. And then it says in verse 3, in verse 3 it says, for when they shall say peace and safety, when the world shall say everything is going well now, and we're, so, we're reaching the, the, the utopian uh, era of the world, civilization is increasing, and now there's going to be peace worldwide. It says when they shall say peace and safety then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman and they shall not escape the people that have not been saved the Lord will come suddenly and they shall not escape the people that are soiling their hands with bribery and corruption they're soiling their hands with blood they're soiling their hands with the filthiness of this world Christ is coming and when Christ comes maybe they are still saying yes I hear Christ is coming but you know that's how they have been saying it I will I will reform I will repair things I will you know do things in the proper way but I still want to do this and this and they keep on soiling their hands suddenly the Lord will come and it says they shall not escape that's what the Lord is telling us in um, Mark chapter 13 and I'm reading from verse 35 Mark chapter 13 reading from verse 35 and it says the kingdom of God it says what she therefore for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening or at midnight or at cock crowing or in the morning in verse 36 it says let's come in suddenly let's come in suddenly he find you sleeping then verse 37 it says and what I say unto you I say unto all 
watch. In Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 34, Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 34, here again is reminding us, it says, take it to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and with drunkenness and the cares of this life. Let's you bury your head in the sand of this world. Let's you throw your heart into the sea of this world. Let's you damage your future, your future in heaven, because you are so entrenched and you are so focused on the things of the world. Lest you are not detached from the things of the world, and the day of the Lord comes upon you, you say, so eating and drinking and the cares of this life will take you away so that so that they come upon you unawares then it says in verse 35 for the snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth what the Lord telling us then in verse 36 in verse 36 what she therefore is coming is going to come suddenly what she therefore is coming is going to come soon what she therefore is coming and the coming is sure what she therefore is coming like it was at the, in the days of Noah in the days of Lord they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage and planting and doing everything until the day came upon them unawares and they did not escape the judgment of the Lord. Watch ye therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We're coming to number three here. Number three is the courageous hearts perfecting saints for his Son coming courageous hearts preparing the saints perfecting the saints and pursuing the saints and getting them back snatching them back from all the things of the world that will try to cloud their view and blindfold them and if we're going to do that as heralds of the Lord and as servants of the Lord will have to be courageous why Satan may stand in your way and say, what's your problem? You're saved, go your way. Why do you want to snatch these people from my own hold? Because Satan's my hinder. He must stand in the way. Watch and be courageous. Why? Because the people themselves, you are trying to help and you are trying to bring them out of all those things in the world. They might be so glued to all their distractions and attractions. All the people you are trying to help, they might even hate you for it. You have to be courageous and say, whatever you do to me, whatever you say to me, however you act to me, I know my purpose, I know my goal, I must get you ready for the coming of the Lord. If you look at the thorns in the way, if you look at the challenges in the way, if you look at the disturbances and hindrances in the way, you might say, what's my problem? Why am I so eager? They have the Bible, they can read the Bible, they can get ready by themselves. After all, the more I run after them and pursue them, I want to get them out from their lethargy and bring them to be ready for the coming of the Lord, the more they throw all these things at me. And then you are wicked and your hands hang down and you cannot... You, you can do something, but you don't want to do anything. That's why we need the courage. The courage to go out there and tell the people that are ignorant of the soon coming of the Lord so that they too will be able to answer the question, who shall uh, abide in the house of the Lord and who shall abide in his holy hill? And then they can say, we that have clean hands and a pure heart. We're looking at my Malachi chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 5. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I 
will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And then in verse 6, it tells us, it says, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to their children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse it tells us in Colossians chapter 1 reading from verse 28 Colossians chapter 1 reading from verse 28 from uh, whom we preach warning every man who will preach warning every man warning every man that takes courage you know the father comes out has a daughter and that daughter is you know in the lap of a sin partner and the father says you know what are you doing there why are you doing that and the, the child the daughter instead of listening to the father he wants to she says what are you doing here why are you wanting me you know I love this young man this young man is the one going to get money and the father goes there to pull away his daughter and the, and the daughter is fighting the father who wants to rescue her from a kind of a, a, a dirty life, a spoiled life, a filthy life. You know, they do that to us. We, we want to go and rescue them and we want to turn their heart away from their pollution, away from their evil, away from their sinfulness and want to perfect them for the coming of the Lord. And instead of fighting their field, instead of fighting their flesh, Instead of fighting their evil, they turn the fight at us. It takes courage for you to say all the same. I'm going to get you out of that all the same. I'm going to get you to Calvary all the same. I'm going to get you to the cleansing blood of the Lamb. We must have that courage. We're walking for eternity and we're serving the Lord for an eternal a virtue so that the people will be ready and come to the Lord. And Paul the Apostle said, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The Lord perfect every one of us. The Lord perfect me. The Lord perfect you. And prepare us for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. He saying his word to us and he's assured us to get to heaven and to be ready when the Lord comes. We must have clean hands. You must examine and check up. Are my hands clean? Do I hide my hand to control bad, evil, sinful, filthy events? Am I totally clean within and without? And a pure heart is my heart pure? Is the purification, the purifying, the sanctification in holiness of the heart? Am I ready for the coming of the Lord? And he says that will be perfect and prepare us for the coming of the Lord. I pray. As you are ready now, you keep ready in Jesus' name. This heaven, nothing will take away from your hand. Nothing will take it away from your heart. And while you are doing that for yourself, making sure before you sleep every night, and then you check up your life, am I ready? Because who knows, at night, at cock crowing, the Lord may come. So, before you sleep at night, you want to check up, Anything during the day that will block my way, hinder my way, you want to get that settled. And then, uh, whenever the Lord comes, whenever the trumpet sounds, you'll go in Jesus' name. And the people, God is helping you to awake, to alert, and to draw, and to bring to Calvary, and to make them convicted and converted and consecrated to the Lord. The Lord will keep on strengthening you you'll not be discouraged you'll not turn back that your converts and the people you are running after you and them them and you will make heaven all together in jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the lord in prayer the lord has spoken to us and we need to respond for ourselves and for the people we're leading that the cleansing of the Lord and the purifying of their hearts and of your hearts will happen that everyone 
them and us, you and them, will be ready for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name.